Uh, we have quite a few questions before um, we move forward, uh, and I would like to go all of them. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we have about 30 minutes for Q&A, so let's try to see if we can uh, make sure we can um, cover all of them. But thank you all, Peter, Sui, and Bill, for uh, great presentation and, and great insight on system thinking. Uh, of course, this, this, this conversation just started, and I'm sure that we have more to talk about and think about and the selection of the noise and how we can clean up that noise and, and make sure that we understand what is noise and what is real. It's quite important as well. The third question is to, that, uh, to Bill and the full panel. Um, and I don't know, maybe Bill, you can take it the first tab of it. How would you define system thinking or systems level thinking? Oh, Bill. Uh... Sure, I can give a try. I mean, I think the easiest way to do it is to is to contrast it with the with the reductionist view. So, um, one view is you're you're always driving to find the microscopic components, and if you find those somehow, you're done, and you kind of take for granted that you could find your way back to the macroscopic phenomena. And I, I think system level thinking is uh, focusing on the fact that that um, there are things that happen at the macroscopic functional behavior, single cells, single organisms, uh, you know, whole organisms, whole cells, whole tissues um, that are not, not, I mean, we, we know that those ultimately have their origins in the molecular, in the microscopic events, but somehow it's not easy to get back. And so you actually have to uh, work at this, at this level that we fought so hard to get away from by finding all the molecular components. But nonetheless, you have to you have to operate there because the path back from the molecular components is just too hard. Any any other additions from Sui or Peter? I agree with that. I think we we all in agreement. Uh, it's really about the uh, the dualism between the microscopic and the macroscopic description. Yeah, absolutely. That 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 the the challenges of of working across scales really force you to go into into uh, I don't know compromises is not the right word but but adaptations which which allow you to um, approach things in a more holistic manner perhaps thank you um, the next one can chaos theory be helpful in understanding of normal and abnormal cellular growth and repair. That question is to Peter. To clarify, chaos theory conceptualized the existence of zones of order and chaos with ongoing pendulum-like transitions of light entities through them from the initial state to the end state. Peter? I mean, that, that, that's a question that uh, Sui should be the uh, <laughs> expert in, in uh, understanding. I know he's thought a little bit about this, but, uh, but you know, maybe I'll take a try and others can, can, uh, can answer it better than me. I think, I think it, it, um, it really goes back to this idea of attractor states and how destabilization from attractor states might happen due to either noise within the system or uh, due to perturbations. And the balance between the uh, absolute values of that noise and those perturbations really starts to explain how these attractors might move from one to another. But, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll defer to my, my more expert uh, physicists uh, for that question. No, maybe I can very quickly, yeah, so I'm, I agree with Peter. And I think the, the short answer is the pathological state is kind of baked in, is abnormal state. So you probably all know when you, your car is a defect and so there are always the same manifestations because of all the constraints there. So essentially what we, the way we look at is in this landscape, which I didn't go into detail, there are many pathological states, they are there. And what mutations do is nothing than making the path to this pathological state easier possible. So, so that's a short answer. Uh, you know, it's inherent in us. That's why we can classify diseases. That's why everybody has the same type of lung tumors. It's not just chaos. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, Peter, you just posed at the end of your talk, uh, where do the system part of math modeling becomes more than just applying empirical models? Where does the complexity become so large that we have to extract key principles 
from the data sets? Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is something that that we're still very much working on is how how can we take um, uh, overall global observations of cell state and 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 try to extract key measurable parameters from that. Um, it, it it's it's uh, you know Bill alluded to this in his talk also. Uh, what what are the and sometimes these parameters might not be um, uh, the identity of a molecule, but might be some um, combination of different factors, molecule, uh, time, uh, uh, um, uh, something to do with um, perhaps a, a, a concentration level, and that together those parameters give us more information about the system as a whole than any one measurement of, of a molecular state. And I think, I think we're all, I am anyway, still struggling in terms of identifying that, but we're getting closer to, to understanding how those combination of parameters might, might give us insights into, into what influences different outcomes within the culture systems. Thank you. I actually, uh, I have a question in, in, in Anne as well, is that we would like to know from you, the three of you, um, what is the idea in terms of noise in the biological systems? Uh, how, what is, how is important and how uh, we can, um, um, their point, your point of view on, on their different modeling approaches, how will you deal with the noise in those systems? And we can start with Sue. Sue? Yeah, I think Bill has nicely summarized the philosophy behind it, right? So in some ways, I think nature takes care of that. And uh, the encouraging thing is for practical reasons, when we do something, we might need not need to uh, drill down to, to all the details. Noise is important, it's very important. Nature takes care of that and utilizes it or suppresses it. And, uh, you know, when we, study noise is, is more academic, but in many ways in, uh, in practical situations, I think uh, we don't need to go into all the details. And that's a good thing about these emergent properties. I don't know what Bill thinks about this. Yeah, I think, so uh, I don't know, I've spent a large fraction of my scientific life worried about noise in, in biological systems. So I guess the short answer is yes, I think it's important. Um, I think that, that sometimes there's a tendency to look at these systems and say, well, they seem to be very noisy, but you really should be careful. Um, to give a, a some kind of old fashioned example, right? If I, you know, back when we had identifiable components of our audio systems that were called amplifiers, right? If you look at the output of an amplifier, it can be incredibly noisy. And that's because you have the you have the gain turned up very high, right? Yeah, that's true. But the amplifier itself could be noiseless, right, or almost noiseless. It's just amplifying the noise that happens to come in at the input. And then you have to ask, well, why is the noise at the input the value that it has? So translated to to the to the biological context, you know, if the concentrations of molecules are low, then all of the processes will be noisy. And that's physics, not biology. Or, physical chemistry or however, I don't know where you want to draw the boundary, but it's not that there's something, the thing that's special about the biology is that for some reason, cells have entrusted these incredibly crucial decisions in their lives to very small numbers of molecules. So that's the, that's the qualitative surprise that's related to poisoning it. And, and as a result, they've made their jobs very difficult. And I at least think that, that some of what we see is a way of dealing with all those, you know, some of the argument that I was giving you was that some of the mechanisms that you see are understandable as ways, you know, as, as Sui put it, you know, suppressing the noise or exploiting it where you need to, that, that a lot of what the cell is doing is shaped by that sort of uh, evolutionary choice at the beginning to operate in a regime where noise is important. And I, why that's true I mean, so can we, could we have imagined cells that, that in which, you know, transcription factor concentrations were micromolar instead of nanomolar? I, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. Nobody works yeah. on that problem, right? Because yeah. that's just not where real cells are. But having 
decided to operate there, they create a whole bunch of problems for themselves, which they then solve. Which, so that's really the amazing thing and why, why I think noise is so interesting. It's, it's not that the system is intrinsically sloppy. Yeah, Claudia, maybe I can add to that. I, I think I think this is really important because um, where I would say that in most cases in at the at the translational end of regenerative medicine, we're still dealing with with the first type of noise that um, that Bill uh, alluded to, which is which is we're just we're just putting too much heterogeneity in the system because either we don't understand the key. Uh, parameters that we're controlling, or or the design of the technology is not appropriate for our our current level of understanding. I'll give you a specific example here. We know that um, you know when we started with pluripotent stem cells, you would put them in you know an undefined aggregate, and you would look at all the differentiation that came out of them, and we would call that noise. We now know that if you put in high concentrations of inductive molecules along certain stages, you get more uniform and coordinated differentiation along the way. It doesn't mean that the underlying biological processes of the cell fate decisions uh, are still, don't have noise as a component in that decision. It just means we've designed systems to overwhelm that in a certain way. And I think, I think this, this um, ability to develop technologies that that give us more control over the system while still reflecting at some stages, there's always going to be this underlying um, uh, um, biological paradigm, which is part of the development process, um, is an important uh, thing to kind of tease apart. Great. Well, thank you. Fascinating. Um, another question to Peter is that in the transit model for dif different T cell phenotypes, how do you obtain different rates for each cell T cell phenotype? Yeah, so this is, uh, I mean, there's a lot of data gathering behind this. When, when uh, um, we have baseline processes where we're measuring uh, both uh, genomic and single cell information as well as a cell level information on that. But, um, but you know, our, one can, as I think um, uh, Bill said in this talk, very quickly you can get into this this idea that you have you know hundreds and uh, as not thousands of parameters to measure in these complex systems, which you could never do at any at any um, um, a reasonable level. But I think that um, uh, having these models that are more abstract to try to see where the parameter sensitivity really makes a big difference has helped us a lot. Um, and, and and so it's a balance between uh, measuring parameters which are. Um, uh, aligned with the types of outputs we have, and then and then looking for uh, places where they don't fit. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, another question: um, Some of the concepts described of controlling the process to reach a desired endpoint sound similar to quality by design approaches in the chemical medicine space. Do the panelists have comments on the similarities or differences? of systems thinking approaches described in the quality by design concepts. And I don't know who wants to take that one. Sweet, you know, Peter? I, I, I must admit, I, I don't know what exactly uh, the QPD. quality by design, uh, so I, I don't know. Peter? Yeah, ha happy to take that one. I mean, uh, you know, I think, uh, actually, I think it's a great opportunity, and I, what I would say is, is, is that um, you know the the data that Sui and and, and Bill showed uh, gives you um, a a cloud of information that falls into the design space in quality by design, and 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 what that allows us to do is think about how to map process parameters to that cloud. And once you have that cloud, you have the flexibility in determining what are the cells in the cloud and thus how parameter and process changes can still be adapted while, while maintaining the, uh, um, the overall uh, attributes that we're after in our cells. I, I think it's a really exciting opportunity because um, uh, uh, currently 
um, we're not able to iterate as fast as we would like around product development. And, and this gives us that opportunity. Yeah, definitely the system thinking could be enabling the quality by design uh, tremendously and, and speed up that as well. Um, another question from the audience is, do the speakers consider the system theory to be hard systems or soft systems methodologies? Anybody wants to take that? I'm not, I'm not really sure what uh, what distinction is being drawn there. Um, I don't understand. Mary, Mary Tobin, I don't know if you want to ex explain better your question. Um, well, let's go for the next one in the meantime. So we, we see if there, we can have some clarification. Um, how do you do we know which attractor state to go to? Say for cell therapies, which attractor state is best for clinical efficacy in a patient? How does system thinking get to that understanding? I guess that's for me. So uh, the two questions here, right? How do we know which attractor to cell to go? That's just the cell type you want to have, right? The other question is how to do that. Um, now, what I've shown you is a very simple picture where you know I want to have cardiomyocytes. Uh, the reality is more complicated. Probably you need a mixture of cell types because what I have neglected and is totally centered to, to, to Peter's work is cells also talk to each other. And that leads to a higher level of dynamics where at the end, probably, and we see that with tumor therapy now, you are not just killing tumor cells. You have to take into account that tissues as well as tumors are villages, right? So it takes a village to grow something. We all hear that. So there are many cell types that talk to each other and, and that's the next challenge. So it's not just choosing which attractor, but which distribution of these million cells among different attractors you need to have. And there we also, like in all regenerative medicine, we still hope that there's some self-organizing principles so that we don't need to know the details and you can just, you know, trigger something and tips development into the right uh, path. Mm -hmm. Any addition from anyone else? Yeah, maybe I could say, you know, to pick up on, on Sui's point about, about cells, which sort of comes from Peter's work about cells talking to each other. You know, if you think about the history of models in developmental biology, you know, you go all the way back to to Turing, um, where the focus was entirely on, if you want, if you, if you sort of translate what he was writing in 1952 in the modern language, um, it was entirely about cells talking to each other and patterns emerging from those spatial interactions. And then everybody said, oh, no, 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 no. So the problem, the problem that Turing posed was the problem of how to get patterns to form in the absence of any spatial inhomogeneities to begin with. But of course, real embryos have spatial inhomogeneities. And so you get the opposite point of view where, you know, the mother places a signal at a particular place or this initial condition sort of drives every cell to make different decisions because it experiences a different concentration of the primary morphogen molecule. So the, the field kind of bifurcated into, you know, a view which was very um, interaction dominated in fact, it was only interactions that produced anything. Cells by themselves wouldn't really do anything interesting. And another view in which everything was entirely cell autonomous. And I, I think we're still a little bit stuck with that bifurcation for, because of the way experiments work, right? You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you disaggregate all the cells and study them individually, then it's hard to probe how they interact with each other. On the other hand, if they're all still together, it's hard to interrogate them individually. Or, there are now ways to do that. So I think that when we get to the point where we have um, really precise tools for interrogating individual cells in situ, where you can also probe their interactions, then those two views will come back together and we'll see that, that you know, of course, uh, that it's some of both. And, and again, one hopes that there are some organizing principles that tell you how those things interact with each other. Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, if if I can jump in, I, I think this is really uh, this is really a, a very exciting area where now how how can the network 
balancing within individual cells and the network structure effect of multi-scale tissue patterning. Um, you know, we have, we just put up uh, about a week ago on Bar Archive, our, a first effort to try to do this. And, and, and even at the very simplistic level, looking at how rewiring and different levels of those factors affect these Turing-like pattern uh, um, uh, events, which occur in, in the most simple tissues, um, um, is, is, is quite revealing actually. So uh, it's a super exciting area. Right. Thank you, Bill and Peter. Um, next question is, can a theory not only help interpret our data, but also tell us what data and what types of data are most valuable to collect to build predictive models for cell state transitions applied to cell therapies? Anybody? Yeah, maybe I, I, I can, sorry, Bill, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say that, that that I think my own experience of this is that you know you have these cycles of you know experiments tell you something when you think about them as a theorist this raises new questions you realize that the interesting theoretical directions uh, depend on things that haven't you know which which direction is interesting depend on things that haven't been measured and so that leads you back to to go make measurements I mean the simplest observation of this is that you know measuring uh, the concentrations of these molecules in the fly embryo, just to stay with the example that I gave, um, it, measuring that at high precision is really difficult. And unless you have some motivation for pushing the experiments to the point where you, know, you really believe that, that measurements at that level of precision would be interesting, you know, you're not gonna do it. And so in that, the, the simplest thing of how accurately do you need to measure things? That's kind of, a, that's a theoretical question. It's not, yeah. I mean, you, you could just, and I think it's a theoretical question because nobody's going to just try and measure things more accurately for the hell of it, right? It's hard work. It's so a lot I, think of work. A lot, I think we have a lot of examples where um, where theory points to, you know, it's worth measuring something, and not not at the, you know, I really wish I knew the affinity of this ligand for this receptor. Of course, you wish that. You didn't really need a theory to tell you. It'd be nice to know that. But more this kind of, you know, how many things do I need to measure at once? How accurately do I need to measure the individual things? What kind of time resolution do I need in order to resolve transitions? You know, to take the picture that that Sui had, you know, could I cat? Could I do, you know, when the chemists talk about a chemical reaction, right? They they try to find ways of catching the molecule in the transition state. So theory tells you how would I catch cells in that transition state at the top of the barrier in that effective potential picture between the between two uh, locally stable configurations of their genetic networks. Um, so I think I think there's lots of examples where where theory is telling you, you know, let's look here, let's look there, let's look there. And the precision of that measurement and how the precision can can bring the information that you need. Maybe the precision gives you too much or too little yeah. of what, what you too much. <laughs> yeah. Can I give a quick answer to that? Because I noticed yes, please. Uh, Go ahead. this is a translational forum and many people come from the pragmatic side. So, and my institution is very translational. So uh, I just, the brief answer is, you know, theory is sometimes purely academic. Uh, people expect theory to do precise predictions, to do things, but it's a broader view and that it, it doesn't hurt to understand the theory and then you decide to what extent it guides your analysis. I think at the moment what we see is way too much purely heuristic computational approaches, you know, just cluster these and that. And so it would help just for your thinking to, to appreciate the theory, even if, as Bill just said, sometimes you don't need to measure all the details for, for pragmatic reasons. Great, thank you. A couple of uh, finish closing uh, questions. How do you determine the boundaries of your system? Much of the work described here in the talks relates to cell engineering and decision-making at the individual cell level. Can you share and describe instances where the quote system needs to be narrowed down to organelles or broadened to the tissue level, multi-tissue level organisms or cohorts of populations or of interacting organisms? Who would like to take that? I don't know. I, I guess I could give it a try. I mean, I think um, 
I think that that the style of more quantitative experiments and theory that you saw from all three of us is one which in which our efforts to draw the boundaries around systems are very explicit and thus easily attacked, <laughs> which is good because, you know, when we draw boundaries, we're, we're, we're making a guess that it, it, it will be productive to draw the boundary in this way. It's not because we believe that there are no interactions across that boundary. It's not that that choice of, of boundary is not sort of given to us from on high. There isn't anything we really know to be sure that that's the right answer, right? It's something we try out. And I think, I think if you look at the history of biology, in many ways, our level of progress and understanding is related to how isolatable the processes we're studying really are that it is characteristic of life that lots of things are all happening at once, right? So I don't know, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about problems in neuroscience. If you ask about what, what things about the brain do we feel like we understand, I think the answer is that we understand things where there's one thing happening in one place. And as we, as we get out from that, it gets harder and harder. So I think it's the same thing here. You draw boundaries to try and make progress and you're always, you're always thinking about whether you drew them in the right place. And so that, you know, that's, that's part of the hypothesis. And the more explicit we are about that, and maybe even as a community, the more different choices we make and explore, the better off we'll be. You know, rather, I mean, it's, it's not fair to respond to work by saying, um, and I, I don't think this was the question, but you know, you drew the boundary here, I don't think that's right. No, it's, I mean, we drew the boundary there and we're trying to see if we can make progress inside that box. And one yeah. of the ways we might fail is that things go in and out of the box way too much for us to, for us to make progress and that's what we'll find out. But I think, I think that's characteristic of, of all of work on biological systems. I mean, in some cases, right, you even take things out of their context I mean, think about studying single molecules, right? You take things out of this complex context in order to make sure that there's nothing that goes in or out, right? And that that's productive in some ways and throws away other things. And so it's a kind of iterative process. I agree, and my short answer is, is might be a bit cynical. You hear so much nowadays, oh, you, you didn't, uh, you didn't consider the context. And I think we have over romanticized the context. Science works by dissection. And at some point, somebody took a heart out of a dead body and it's still a heart. And that's how science works. We just need to do that operationally, but be aware of the context. And the context and the time point that you are considering yeah. that context. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of more. Um, to Bill, is there a specific form of entropy that captures the system information best? Say Shannon versus the Siley's entropies, for instance. Oh, uh, well, there's a, a much more technical question. Um, so indeed, there are many entropies. Um, the, there's Shannon, there's Salas, there's, there's Renyi, and Renyi has many orders. Uh, they each have uses. I think the thing that corresponds, I think what Shannon showed us is that the thing that corresponds to our intuition about what information means is the Shannon entropy, which is also the same as the entropy in, in physical chemistry or statistical mechanics and so on. Um, the other entropies can be very useful in part because they're much easier to estimate from data. Um, and so there's a whole practical world of if you want to use information theoretic ideas, how do you actually get at um, these information theoretic quantities from finite experiments? And for that, many of these other things are very useful. But I think conceptually, um, the, the Shannon entropy is privileged. Okay, and I think that I, I'm being asked to wrap up because we are on, on, the, on the time frame that we were given. I know that there are a couple of additional questions. Maybe we, we send them offline to you guys for, for your comments. I would like to thank you, Sui, Biel, and Peter for an amazing panel, uh, enlightening information, and I'm sure a lot of more uh, thinking behind the scenes for us to understand this 
um, set of data, how can we make the most of it? How the interaction of the data occurs and, and how we can make uh, the most of this to make, again, uh, th therapies available in a more accurate way and in a cost-effective way to patients. So thank you all of you for your insight and we look forward to the next panel that is going to be at one o'clock. We are going for a break right now. And so looking forward to um, have you all back at one with Anne and, and the next uh, part of the agenda. Thank you all. <laughs>